Welcome back, warriors. What? What? <laughs> I feel like I always have to change my tenor every time I say it. I'm like, do I say it the same way? And now I'm having anxiety about like welcoming everyone. <laughs> Welcome, y'all. Welcome back, warriors. It's my NPR yes. attempt. So helpful. Helpful, happy, <laughs> hopeful. Sure. We let's are. go with all the H words. Helpful, happy, hopeful hilarious 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 we're so funny anyway <laughs> welcome welcome back we're so glad you're here with us we are going to be talking about something today that uh, was one of my ideas mm -hmm. and after I suggested it to Abby I had almost immediate regret right <laughs> I feel like it was like oh, I really think this topic feels feels like it's something I want to talk about mm -hmm. but I also feel super uncomfortable talking about it. And yeah. I don't know if it's a good thing to talk about or a bad thing. And that was like instant anxiety with like, ah, oh, should we talk about this thing? And the thing is, is uh, anxiety surrounding um, appearances, yeah. surrounding the body, body anxiety. And so I got to be honest and say that I feel really buzzy right now. Mm -hmm. And I felt mm -hmm. buzzy just right at below the surface all week thinking about this episode wow. and recording. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's really, for me, it's a, it's interesting. Cause I know that with some of these episodes, uh, when we know what we're going to talk about, I can feel like a little edgy, a little jittery. Um, but, but for this episode, I'm kind of like, ah, like, I don't, I don't, you know, I, uh, I, when, when you mentioned this topic, I was like, yeah, I've definitely experienced some anxiety around appearances and stuff, but, um, for me, it's less jittery. And, and so it's always so interesting when, um, when we have different experiences around a similar topic. Yeah. Yeah. Like when I remember when you said around social anxiety that you oh, yeah. have a lot of anxiety in your body yeah. when, and that one, and that you had only just recently started admitting that certain parts of your anxiety were yeah. related to social anxiety. And for me, it was like, I knew I was socially anxious and awkward for so many years <laughs> and I just fully embraced that part of me. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, it is so interesting the way we both kind of approach each topic and yeah. where our minds go when we think about it. Right. Right. Yeah. So how are you doing? Would you, would you like to start with talking a little bit about your experiences yeah. with appearances? Right. <laughs> experiences with appearances. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, right off the bat, I feel like it's really important to say like this topic can be really triggering for some yeah. people. Yeah. And just thinking about, um, bodies, right. Mm -hmm. Which it, it sounds like, it doesn't sound crazy. I always, I always say that, but at the, at the end of the day, none of it sounds crazy to me to be like, there's something wrong with someone's body. No, right. like a body is a body. It's a vessel. Yeah. It, it helps us to move through the world and it's got so much value and purpose inherently all types of bodies. Right. But it, it can still feel like a sticky subject right. for folks. Um, so I just want to say that Hopefully, uh, there's an understanding that anything that we share here on the podcast is about our lived experiences, um, and not some sort of like diagnosed anything. Right. Right. And, and we're just looking to shed light on the way that, um, anxiety surrounding the physical body has shown up for us and yeah. not sort of like as a means of letting you know how you should feel about your body or if your lived experience is extremely different. Um, and if this was a struggle or wasn't a struggle for you, say as a, as a young adult or a teen mm -hmm. or, um, as an adult that there's something wrong with you. It's, it's again, it's always the opposite. It's just that like, it helps me and, and you, right. Abby so yeah. much to share this stuff yep. mm -hmm. out loud and, uh, it helps me to process my own anxiety around different topics, talking about it. So I just yeah. want to say that off the top. Um, you know, when I think about my body and the anxiety that I had always felt surrounding my, um, surrounding my physical body, I always felt like pretty good about mm -hmm. it. 
And then I would get these mixed messages from the world Mm -hmm. about what a good body is supposed to be able to do. What is a good body supposed to be able to um, fit into? What is a good body supposed to be able to uh, look like? Right. Um, And so, you know, I grew up thin. I was, I come from a, a thin family, our family's, mm-hmm. you know, pretty small in, in, in terms of like mass, um, you know, and, and I grew up with parents and siblings that were very, very active. I was a dancer um, and thinking about it reflectively, like there was just so many things that were showed to me and taught to me mostly inadvertently. I, I want to believe yeah. that being small meant that you were healthy, Mm -hmm. right? Like Mm -hmm. that there was some kind of an equation between being tiny and being healthy, eating a certain amount (laughs) in order to maintain your smallness physically. Right. And then it winds up being a metaphor for me about being small in my mind as well. (laughs) Um, and what is, what it means to be a a full embodied person and, and what all bodies are capable of, which took me a long time to sort of come around to that idea. Um, but you know, there was this moment when I was a child, my, my tiny little Puerto Rican grandma, she hugged me when I was around in my tween years, you know, somewhere between like nine and 11. And she gave me this warm and loving smile and she goes, Oh, you're so fat. (laughs) And I remember distinctly being like, wait, what? Right. Cause like my brain up until that was, it's like, I was sort of taught again, inadvertently, like what fat looks like and how not to be that. Right. And, uh, hearing this from my grandmother was a super struggle. Right. And nobody, and everyone kind of like, Oh, you know, like laughs and smiles long. And I'm like, Oh my God, I had this immediate complex. Am I, am I quote unquote fat? What does fat even mean? Wait, let me go back into what, what I believe fat to mean and try to, you know, um, analyze it. And what I learned way later in life was like, you know, maybe not way later, but later it was like Puerto Rican culture. It's like, it's a good thing to be fat. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's said in loving terms, like little yeah. gordita, gordo, like, it's just, it's not a bad thing. And, but I'll never forget this moment. It was just like this trigger for me. I was like, mm. Oh my God. Now somebody out in the world thinks I'm fat. Right. right? And that my immediate association was like, that's bad. Right. That's a bad thing right. that I shouldn't be. Um, and you know, again, the, the messages, right. That were sent as children and as adults of like, what does it mean to have a good body? Yeah. Right. And so like, I don't know about you, but I always felt like, oh, okay, well, I'm pretty small and athletic and healthy. So I must have a good body. Mm -hmm. And then I would look around right at other people's bodies and think, well, their body must not be as good as mine. Right. And now all of a sudden I have someone telling me that I don't have a good body, right. In Mm -hmm. terms of like what in my small child mind, what that meant. And it was like, now what, what do I do? Right. Um, I think that's part of like, growing up in the eighties and nineties. I don't know if you can speak to this experience at all. It's like, we didn't talk about, um, this kind of stuff no. as kids yeah, like, at all. And, um, you know, as I got older, like into my high school years, it was kind of like, all right, you know, you're still, you're still sort of riding the train. You, you you've sort of gotten rid of the complex you had about, <laughs> your grandma calling you fat, even though that wasn't the reality. But again, right. those messages are out there in the world. And I still have my adolescent brain telling me what is correct and what isn't correct, what's healthy, what's unhealthy. And it was like, then you look around as a teen. Mm-hmm. I'm looking at entertainment. I'm looking at media. I'm looking yes. at magazines. Like when we were, we were kids, it was, there were no cell phones, right? It was like, let's go to 7-Eleven and grab a Slurpee and a magazine. And, mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. Like, and we learned quote unquote, really, we, we learned terrible things, which is, yeah. oh, people with long hair are sexy. Yes. People with short hair aren't sexy. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. People with big boobs. That's great. Mm-hmm. People with small boobs, not great. Right. It's mm-hmm. just like, if you didn't meet up to whatever you were seeing out there in the world, it's like, well, what does that say about me then? Right. right. Started looking at myself 
Like I think a lot of teens maybe do at least at some point potentially and thinking my body is not good enough. Right. And the whole time I wasn't considering all the amazing things that my human body was doing for me. Right. Right. Because it was all about what do I look like on the outside? Yeah. What do I look like to other people? When someone looks at me, do they think, is that a good body? Right. And in the way that we defined it as little kids and Mm -hmm. as tweens and teens. Um, yeah, I'm going to pause there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. How are you doing? I'm okay. I'm good. You know, there, I, I want to say a bunch of things <laughs> and, and, and the one that I want to say, I want to like, obviously, you know, like I'll say the whole thing because I yeah. know that the way I, that it comes out, it could sound dismissive. And obviously that's not what I'm going for. Okay. And, and, and what I want to say is like, it's just, you never know other people's stories because we've talked about like, I think you're just radiant and vibrant. And, you know, when I first met you, I'm like, oh my God, she's gorgeous. And, you know, like, I mean, like you have an amazing body, right? This is like the stories I tell myself about you when I first met you. And now when I see you and stuff like, yeah. And, and it's just so, I think, important to realize that my experience of you doesn't mean that that's your experience of you. Right. You know? And so when people look like they have it all together, we don't know what's below the surface. Exactly. That's exactly it. Yeah. 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 Go Go ahead. ahead. No, no, that was it. Okay. The other thing that I want to say is, you know, when you're talking about those magazines and yeah, we grew up in the eighties and nineties. Um, it made me feel really sad. Um, because, especially, you know, um, the female gender is told like you are what you look like, (laughs) you know, right. Um, look pretty, be quiet. Don't question authority. Be small, be small, not just in body. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and things are shifting, not fast enough, not good enough at all. I think it's more parents being woke to how they speak to their kids. Um, but, but it just made me really sad because in our society growing up, the message was all about how you look and, yeah. and how you look will determine how successful you are. And for a woman, success is, you know, finding a good husband, <laughs> and, right. you know, like, I mean, it's, um, so it just made me sad because I remember getting those magazines and I remember like daydreaming about Zach Morris and, you know, <laughs> Mark Paul <laughs> Gosler and Jonathan Taylor Thomas, but also like they would never want me I'm right like tall and skinny and blonde and perky. And I don't wear makeup, you know, like all the things that things. you assume you're supposed to be in order to be that good. Yeah. And I keep going back to that. It's like, what does it mean to have a good body? Yeah. Right. And we weren't taught what that meant. And no. it's funny because I had this moment too, and it's a story I wasn't going to share, but now I'm going to, um, I was like 12 and I was at a pool party And everyone had left the pool and it was just me and the girl whose house I was at and a friend of hers who I didn't really know very well. And we were all up in her room afterwards and and her mom was like, oh, just get changed and we'll have pizza. And then, you know, Margo and and -and so-and-so will go home. And we went upstairs and I like went to walk into the bathroom to get changed out of my my bathing suit to go get my clothes back on to go eat pizza. And the other two girls were like, no, no, just come in the room and change with us. And like, immediately I was like, Mm, okay. So I go in the room with them and the two of them just stripped down completely naked in front of me. We were 12 years old. And I remember being completely shocked. I didn't grow up in a house like that. Right. Yeah. And not, not, and I would never even dream of undressing in front of friends. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And these two girls undressed in front of me so casually. And then they stood in front of the, I'll never forget this. They stood in front of the mirror and dissected their bodies. Oh my gosh. But not in a negative way. Oh. Well, not a hundred percent negative. Some of it was negative, but the other half of it was like, oh, but this is great about me. It was a very interesting paradox between yeah. the two of them. But then they were looking at each other and examining each other. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't mean physically. I mean, like they were just sizing each other up. 
but, mm-hmm. but they were being very blunt about it. And I was just sitting there like, I can't wait to get out of here. This is the most yeah. uncomfortable thing I've ever experienced. And they were like, Margo, are you going to get changed? And I was like, you know what? I'm like, maybe these suits pretty dry anyway. I'm just gonna throw my clothes on over it. I'm like eat pizza really fast and get the hell out of here. Yeah. But like, it was a fascinating moment because immediately my thoughts went to a, I'm not comfortable enough with my own body to change in front of anybody. Yeah. <laughs> and B, well, if so-and-so just said that her boobs are quote unquote too small, then I'm screwed because <laughs> my boobs are non-existent. <sighs> And like, obviously years later, this is something I fully embrace. <laughs> I'm the queen, the president of the itty bitty titty committee. <laughs> um, can we say titty? <laughs> I don't know. We'll find out. We're going to find out. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> we're we're going to test the water there. Um, but yeah, I, and you know, I mean, and I'm going to get into like all the amazing ways that I love and, and appreciate and embrace my body. But it, it was one of those moments where once again, I looked at these girls and I thought, oh, well, if her boobs are too small, then how could I ever take my bathing suit top off and and have them see what I'm working with here? Right. 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 Like again, it's, this wasn't, this was an inadvertent message from someone my age, but yeah, I, for some reason, they just, what you were saying, what triggered that story reminded me of like those messages from childhood, how they show up throughout life. That, I mean, that's it. It's like, you got the message from your grandmother. And then you also get the message from the magazines and you get the message from your peers, you know, you get the message from society. And, right. and it's just the, the sad part is, is we are at an age where we're being told this stuff, but we don't necessarily have the ability to critically think about what we're being told. Right. So we just take it in as truth. Mm-hmm. And, or what we're seeing. Yeah. Cause again, it wasn't even stuff we were told. No one right. said to me, like this body is good. This body is right. This, you know, this weight is good. This weight is nobody right. said anything. All I had to do was look around. All I had to do was notice the way women and girls specifically, but, mm-hmm. but boys too, in our class growing up were talked about. It was always something about a body yeah. that yes. really was attacked as well. And so that was the message I was getting. It was less like, well, something's wrong with Margo because of X, Y, and Z. All mm-hmm. that stuff was in my own head. And I always thought like, well, if I just lay low, no one will say anything ever. (laughs) It's just so interesting. And and I feel more comfortable about talking about this now that it's been a few minutes and I appreciate you kind of like jumping in with your two cents. And that's made me feel a lot more grounded in this conversation Um, because I do feel like the way we look at ourselves Mm -hmm. and the way we speak to ourselves is so important to our mental health, yeah. right? And it, it is about our physical self too. The way we talk about our physical body, the way we look at ourselves in the mirror, the mm-hmm. way we are told to suck things in or shove yourself into that little outfit or whatever, otherwise you're not sexy or cute, quote unquote, mm-hmm. or whatever it is. It's so important to sort of remember that a lot of us have anxiety about the way that we look, about our yeah. appearances, even as fully formed functioning adults and that it's not abnormal to experience anxiety surrounding this stuff. Um, You know, so one of the things that's really changed for me in terms of the way that I look at my body was yoga, Mm -hmm. right? When I found yoga, when I turned 18, pretty early on, pretty quickly, I realized that, oh, this practice isn't about what I look like at all. This practice is literally the opposite of what it looks like. This is all about feeling, 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 um, and connecting and being connected to your physical body, uh, being grateful for the parts of your body that are functioning Mm -hmm. for all the body parts that do things for you when you're asleep, right. When you're not even having to move or do anything. Um, and just having this fresh perspective from the practice of yoga Mm -hmm. and then the practice of mindfulness and, and, um, active gratitude, uh, really helped me, uh, to change my relationship to my body before yoga. I'd never considered how anything felt on the inside, like ever. Um, and that was super powerful, you know, but it still took a long time for me to let go of the idea of what was fullest or best say in expressing a yoga pose or a Mm -hmm. posture or something too. Right. It's like, I wanted to compare still it's like, Oh, well, if I'm not looking at the woman or the man or the person next to me and comparing what my, 
you know, version of the poses to theirs and like, what good am I? Right. And uh, yoga eventually teaches you that like ego, it teaches <laughs> you about your ego, first of yeah. all. And then it teaches you how to break down a little bit right. slowly sometimes, but to break it down um, and how to seek information from my body to listen to it before yeah. I move. Yeah. Right. And so yoga really changed my relationship to my body. And now kind of like when I notice myself holding or feeling tense anywhere, my immediate reaction is to, uh, and again, it came from lots of practice to first notice and then do what I can to gently release Yeah, or even to touch that part of my body and mm-hmm. send it love and gratitude. Right. Yeah. Um, that's, that was new for me too. It's like, Hmm. I never thought about thanking my shoulders before and carrying my bags around for so long, like, right. but actively doing that, right. Bringing right. my hands to this part of my body, feeling all its amazingness it's in whatever it is and how hard it has to work right. to do X, Y, and Z, to help right. me stand up straight, to hold things, right. um, to lift things, you know, from the ground, like whatever it is. Um, and being able to actively send myself and various parts of my body, gratitude and love Mm. has been a a big game changer in my practice. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like one major thing is like it shifted from being disembodied and trying to fix the body, whatever that means, right? to becoming embodied and listening to the body. Yeah. Um, But then also just acknowledging like everything that, that we take for granted every single day. Right. And acknowledging like, damn body, you do a lot of stuff. It's For not real. just about how you look. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And I just love that. Um, I think there's something to be said for just growing and aging and experiencing things mm-hmm. too, mm-hmm. to be able to say, it's okay that I used to judge or And when I say judge, I mean myself or, and others, but myself a lot about, um, how much I ate Mm -hmm. or, you know, why I, why that doesn't fit the way it used to or whatever the situation and and that it's an ongoing process, right? Having a positive relationship to, to your body can sometimes feel like it's a relationship and relationships take work. Yes. They take effort. They yeah. take consistency and showing up. Yeah. Yeah. Right. It's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of like deprogramming. It's a lot of like changing the programs that are running in the mind. Um, and it's really unfortunate that it's the expense of, of our body, right? Like that's yeah. the really unfortunate part is like, we are born with these bodies and then pretty early on, we're told all the things that are, you know, quote unquote wrong with them. And, and that's not, that's not the case. Like even like having hair on your body, you know, like, you know, it was yes. a, um, a shaving company that wanted more money. So they decided that in the twenties, when, when women were, you know, wearing sleeveless dresses, it was like, ew, armpit hair is gross. You need to shave that because then they get to sell more razors, you know? Right. So this stuff has been going on for so long and it's at the profit of other people and at the expense and, and, and damage of our, of our mental health and our well-being and our relationship to the thing we're with the most, our body. Yeah. 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 This was, this was my topic. And so I had a lot to say about it, yeah. but if you have anything you want to share or add, like, I'd love to hear yeah. some of your experiences. I was fortunate enough where like, you know, I, I grew up in Woodstock and, um, there wasn't a lot of, as long as like, as much as I can remember, there wasn't a lot of emphasis on looks and appearances aside from like, yes, on the magazines and on TV and stuff. And like, I grew up in a household, like where my mom doesn't wear makeup, you know, her sisters do, but she didn't. And so I never really grew up doing makeup or anything. And, and, you know, so, so for me, like I never gave that much thought to my appearance for quite some time. And then in middle school and high school um, was when I started to get the messages from other people that my appearance wasn't okay. And so I have dark hair and I have dark hair on my arms. 
And I mean, as a grown up, I'm like, this is normal. It's not, it's not like something that needs to be addressed. And it's not like, I mean, and I'm saying this because the, the middle schooler in me is still mortified, but the group of boys that like the girls had crushes on, but they were also jerks, like would, um, call me Amazon Abby and make fun of my arms. Yeah. And so I started like shaving my arms and nearing my arms and wearing long sleeves. Um, And, and then uh, they would also, I was one of the people that in middle school started to actually develop boobs and I'm on the bigger side now of of the boob side. And um, they would call me munchkin, like the, like the donuts munchkins. And so they constantly were drawing attention to my arm hair and the size of my chest. Um, and then on top of that, I had anxiety and I would, um, sweat. (laughs) And so I would wear a lot of like long, like sleeve black shirts so that I could hide the sweat and I could hide the arms and my breasts would look smaller. Um, so that was like something that really stuck out in middle school and high school was that other people pointing out my appearance. Um, Mm -hmm. And, you know, then even stuff like uh, I had a good friend and in like sixth or seventh grade, we were at some party and I was dancing and she was like, you dance weird. And so I like didn't dance again until I went to college and I would have alcohol in me. Right. And so like I would keep getting these messages from other people that my body was weird or, you know, and, and so it definitely like caused me to change behaviors wearing black shirts, not dancing at parties for all of high school, you know? Yeah. Um, but, but ultimately it didn't really like dominate my forethought, you know, in a sense, like, I mean, I was always like unconsciously comparing myself to others and unconsciously not feeling good enough. You know, I'm not that tall, lanky blonde that I was told was, you know, the person that would get like all the guys and be successful, you know? Right. Um, but, but also at the same time, like it wasn't like, it didn't dominate my thoughts about like losing weight and, you know, all of, all of that. It was kind of just like baseline who I was, it was just, you know, it was just, yeah, hard to explain. Um, but more recently, um, it's funny when I got out of that, like five and a half year relationship and I started dating again, um, I, uh, I, I saw a friend And this wasn't like a date or anything. And I hadn't seen him in years and years. And he had seen me on like social media and stuff. And he, in person, one of the first things he said to me was like, you know, I think it's so brave that you're letting your hair go gray. And I'm like 34 and newly single and like, you know, trying to figure out if I'm ever going to like find a partner and this and that. And I have these like gray things that kind of look like, um, I think her name's rogue from X-Men. So it's like kind of cool. So I was always letting myself like be okay with it. Um, but then between him and like two other people that pointed out my gray hairs, I was like, F this. Now I have to dye my hair. If it's that obvious to everyone that they feel the need to comment about it, then it's something that I needed to change. Right. And so I actually did. I dyed my hair like, you know, at 34, 35, 36. Um, And then the other thing that really just comes up for me now is, you know, before I moved to Colorado, um, I was super fit, most fit I've ever been in my life. Thank you, kickboxing. I miss you so much. And then moving to Colorado, I didn't really find like any yoga or kickboxing studios that I was like super, you know, into. And, um, you know, I started dating Dan and we would go out to dinner and we would have a cocktail or two. And then, you know, the pandemic hit and, um, I really haven't worked out at all. And, and I've put on like, you know, 15 pounds. And so I definitely have the experiences now of, you know, looking in the mirror or getting on the scale and like feeling so uncomfortable. Um, but also like being in the mindset of knowing like this can change. It's changed before weight doesn't define you. Like at least you have your health. Right. But then the, like, 
instant go-to reactions that happen when I like, when Dan and I take a selfie and my face looks like, you know, wider than usual. And my instant like reaction is to cringe. And it's like, that Mm. sucks because I can hold both Mm. in it. Like the instant reaction of like seeing that my face has changed and not liking the way it's changed because I've been told that that's not okay. And then the like watching it of like, wow, that really sucks that that's your go-to reaction. <laughs> like, right. as opposed to like, oh, that's a great picture of you and your husband looking happy together. Um, and so, you know, like where I am now is like just navigating that duality and, and just like reminding myself, like when we were talking about the media before, like I remember in recent years and that could be like seven in the last seven years or so, um, Sports Illustrated had a softball player on their cover and they showed most of her body and it was like from the side and her body was like not very skinny and there was some rolls and there was, you know, and I felt like that was like my body. And like, I remember seeing that and being like, I wish I had that as a role model as a kid, you know, like just show all bodies because really the most important thing that I I really remind myself is like, if I don't have my health, I have nothing. So I have my health and I can be grateful for that. And then I can choose what changes I want to make. And are they based on what's true for me? Are they based on what I've been programmed with from society? Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. Like what you said about, um, you know, those, those hard years, those middle school years, uh, those are just the worst years, right? Like there are, there is just so much that kids at that age need and that are, they're going through and they're Mm -hmm. really misunderstood a lot. Yeah. Um, and I know you have such great, you work so, so well with that age group, right? <laughs> so like, them. they're so lucky to have <laughs> you. And I, that you've said too, it's like part of the reason why you, I think you, you always feel so comfortable with that age is because of your own lived experiences yeah. at that age. Um, uh, and just the thing, the thing about like noticing gray hair, it's like, oh, I didn't really notice this, but now that other people <laughs> are noticing it and not just noticing it, but are telling me about yeah. it, well, that must mean that they're uncomfortable. And they're telling and so me I I'm to... brave, like, right. No, oh, no. Brave. <laughs> Don't tell people they're brave for not dyeing their hair, please. Absolutely please. ludicrous. <laughs> <laughs> but then like you, what you said back in the beginning of our conversation where it was just like, you don't understand what anyone's going through at any yeah. point. And that doesn't mean that we're all going to say things that might offend someone at some point, or that right. might be deemed insensitive or less than good. And, and maybe that person is, tells us that they, we made them upset or maybe they don't. And, right. and I know there are plenty of people where I wanted to say something and I didn't right. about this topic or any topic. Um, and there's always, you know, regrets to be had and apologies to be made as long as they're genuine. But I just find the notion of like what we're teaching kids at, or what we're perpetuating in society is that who you are, isn't good enough whether it's body, mind, soul, spirit, whatever it is, that it, it better change or conform. Otherwise something's wrong. Something's yeah. not good enough. Something's right. not good. Something's off. Um, and I just appreciate what you said too, about like, there are that your health is, is if you don't have your health, you don't have anything. And yeah. I think that what health looks like to everyone is so different too. Yeah. It's really important to acknowledge that. Yeah. I just think it's, it's so interesting the way we all perceive our bodies yeah. over yeah. the years and, and how deep rooted so much of our, our feelings about bodies are from mm-hmm. our childhoods. Yeah. yeah. It takes, it's a lot of, it's a lot of deprogramming. It's a lot of like, I like to think of like, like deeply implanted beliefs is like, um, like a garden and it's all these like weeds and rocks and stuff. And you don't even see all of them at the surface, but to like right. have a healthy relationship with your body, you have to really do the work of pulling out all of the messages you've been told and then asking yourself, is this true for me? Is this what right. I believe? Asking yourself. Yeah. That's the key, right? Yeah. yeah. Asking yourself and not the dumbass who said, Oh, you're so brave to keep your, some of your gray hair. It's like, 
excuse you. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah, that's talk. the only reason I got married is because I hid my gray hairs, you know, like <laughs> that's it. I mean, if Dan knew I had gray hairs when we met, probably wouldn't have married me. <laughs> that's joke. it. He would have been like, I'm done people. with this lady. <laughs> Right. (laughs) Obvious joke. Well, let's hope it's an obvious joke, but it's true. Like, and even, and I'm sure that this might be true for some warriors out there that even now, if you, even if you're in a happy and stable and healthy relationship with another person, Mm -hmm. you hopefully have some of that for yourself. But if you're having a relationship with another human being, um, and you have some anxiety about your body with that person, right. That that's something to reflect on. Yeah. What's going on that, that you're not, that you, that you're with a person that you feel maybe you can't be your full literal bodied self with. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So friends, warriors, something to think on this week, right? Reflect on your relationship to your body. Um, what is your relationship to your body now? What was it growing up? Are there things that you need to unlearn that you haven't yet? Mm -hmm. Uh, Are there judgments that are being placed on yourself or others about, Mm -hmm. about what makes a body good? Um, And just take some time with this idea of uh, how can I better serve my anxiety, right? The warrior in me that might have worries or fears or struggles with, with the body and how can I meet that anxious bodied person with more love and more grace and more compassion in my yeah. everyday? Yeah. So we hope you'll think about that a little bit today or this week. Yeah. All right. Uh, so jumping into our new segment. Yes. Active practice. Active practice. <laughs> active practice segment. It's new, so it's clunky. It's new, yeah. <laughs> But we actually received this idea from our number one fan, Robin Rivera. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Robin. We love you. We know you're listening. Um, She said, you know, we talk a lot about somatic holds Mm -hmm. and it would be great if we spent a little bit of time sort of digging into what it is and how to practice. And I, you know, I had made a reel on this on Instagram way back, but, um, we talk about it and joke about it because for both of us, it's such a go-to, yeah. but we never really broke it down. And so this sort of kicked off an idea of trying to offer everyone out there a practice. So mm-hmm. our active practice for the week is somatic holds. Abby, yeah. why don't you tell everyone a little bit about what they are? Yeah. So I will share what they are, but then you might also add something because the beautiful thing about all of these practices is there's not one way to do them and there's not one thing about them. Um, so I actually learned about somatic holds first from Linda Graham. Um, I saw her speaking live at some event and she talked about somatic holds and she talked about, um, just placing your hands on your heart and how near your heart, there's a lot of um, oxytocin receptors and then with the power of touch. So I actually try to like have my hands, like actually touch the skin near my heart, um, that that can create a calming effect. Uh, and so when I think about somatic holds, right, there's not just the heart one, but that is my go-to. There's other ways. Soma means body. And so somatic hold means a way of holding your body. And there's ways where you can involve like your forehead in it or your shoulders in it, or you're giving yourself a hug. And again, there's no wrong way to do these. And, and, and Peter Levine has some writing and some, uh, I think videos that are all around different somatic holds. He has a book called healing trauma, and there's definitely some, um, pictures in there of people doing somatic holds. Um, do you want to add anything to what I've said so far? I mean, no, it's like literally (laughs) what I would have said, like straight up. I'm just sitting here like, okay, nothing to add, nothing to add. (laughs) Look, I, so yeah, as Abby just illustrated perfectly, it's, to me, it's a, it's a gentle, loving, but slightly firm pressure mm-hmm. on various parts of the body. And yeah. yes, it could be anywhere on your body, but, um, 
hand to heart is, is my number one mm-hmm. go-to. I find it to be very accessible. Yeah. It doesn't draw a lot of attention either, no matter what situation you're in. Mm-hmm. It's great for in the moment self-care. Yes. Right. Meaning like, I don't have time to move through a practice or grab, get my phone and have a phone call with a loved one to help soothe my anxiety, whatever it is. I need something right now. That's mm-hmm. it's very, it, it can be very powerful and soothing in the moment. Yeah. Just some gent, uh, loving, but firm pressure on various points of the body. Mm-hmm. My other favorite is the self hug. So it's like, imagine taking your hand across your body, resting it on your shoulder, bringing your other hand across your you know belly and resting the hand on the ribs kind of thing. Really yeah. allowing the arms to be heavy. Maybe you tuck your chin down. Yeah. And then do the same thing, but with the other arm on top. Right. Um, that's my second favorite. But that one might look a little bit more, you know, I won't say strange, but obvious. It's not as because someone's going to notice you look doing that. So yeah. say if you're on the subway, you may not want to do that. Or maybe you do. Like, and so you do. You do whatever kind of hold feels supportive. Another option yeah. is um, hands to heart and belly. Yep. And this is a great one for if you're going to involve some um, attention to the breath. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in um, just checking in with your breathing, not breathing in any special way, but just placing your hands on these spaces, hand to heart, hand to belly, and just noticing the movement of your breath naturally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, You know, belly pressure with forehead pressure Mm -hmm. is another option. So hand to belly, hand to forehead. Um, But again, it's, it's really anywhere that you feel called to hold. Yep. Um, but we always love the hand to heart. Yeah. Yeah. That's the go-to. And, you know, for, for me, I sometimes do it as a seated practice. You know, I sometimes sit with my hand, one hand or both hands on my heart and, um, I'll, you know, sometimes just anchor into my breath and notice my breath and notice my chest moving as I breathe or I'll feel my heartbeat, you know, I'll use some type of sensation to keep me in the moment. Um, Sometimes I keep my hand on my heart and um, I'll say what I need to tell myself, you know, whatever that is. Like if I'm struggling with something, I'm feeling overwhelmed. I'll tell myself I totally got this or I, you know, breathe in love and breathe out whatever I don't need in that moment. Um, but the thing with this practice is, you know, I do it when I'm walking, I'll do it if I'm on the phone, you know, it's just kind of my go-to for helping regulate me in the moment. And so I don't need to go sit somewhere and do it. I don't need to go move somewhere and do it. It's just like a natural hand on my heart. And then whatever feels or like what feels right next breathing heartbeat, narrative telling myself when I need to hear whatever that is, is the next piece and changes based on how I'm doing. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So hopefully this is something, um, anyone listening that's interested in giving a try feels comfortable with trying out and you can literally do it. As I said, it's, it's an, in the moment type of practice. So it's like, I need it now. And you can offer it to yourself right now. Yep. Um, because as Abby said, very fittingly before is that your body's always with you. It's the one tool that you have at your disposal. Yes. It's part of your anxiety, right? <laughs> it's also the cause of so much, but, um, reminding we're, we're, we are the anchor. Yeah. We, we can re-anchor with, with potentially a somatic hold. So then we thought this would be a powerful one to lead us off with this segment because we were talking about bodies this week. Right. Right. Um, And it's just, to me also, I'll just end with, with this idea of like, it's a, it's a great way for me to reconnect to my body and show it some love. Mm -hmm. So even if it's not with an affirmation or some kind of, um, positive self-talk, like you had just said, which sometimes I do that, it's just a way for me to like reconnect to my body and show it some love. And it's my way of almost saying, I love you is putting my hand to my own heart. Yeah. So there is a right way or wrong way to do this. Nope. Put your hand on your in charge and do whatever you need after that. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. But I'm glad you brought up some of the other stuff you do while your hand is there, right? Because it is, there are things that you can add to that practice, right? To make it even more um, supportive, hopefully. Yeah. All right. Time for win of the week. Win of the week. Okay. Win of the week is coming from me this week. And I mentioned it before. And it was just that I took myself to the doctor. 
my body Huge. was like, Margo, Margo, hello, lady. You need to get me something uh, stronger, <laughs> something else. What you're doing, it's not helping me right now. And I need something else. And so I finally listened and I took myself to the doctor. And that was a huge win because I really, I'm not afraid of the doctor. Like I don't have white coat syndrome. It's not like that. Um, I know for some people, they just really don't like going to the doctor for that reason. I understand that completely. For me, it's more of just like the act of making the appointment Mm -hmm. and scheduling it and getting all the way there Mm -hmm. and then waiting and paperwork. Oh, I just hate the procedural stuff about the doctor's office. And so I was very proud of that moment this week. And I'm now on some meds (laughs) for you. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully feeling better soon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like that's a huge win. I know a ton of people, including myself that like to prolong things when just get it addressed. Just Just do it. it. I know. Live in the struggle. We're always, we always want to live in the struggle. (laughs) I don't know why. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my goodness. All right. Well, this was, um, such a great episode. We hope Mm -hmm. that all of you, uh, at least took away something to reflect upon in your own life. Yeah. And, uh, we want to hear from you. We want to hear, um, your thoughts on this topic. If you have any, uh, topic ideas, if you are interested in hearing us talk more about specific practices that we've mentioned on the podcast, but you'd like Mm -hmm. more information about, we can add it to our new segment in future episodes. So reach out to us, um, on Instagram, we're at anxiety warriors podcast, or shoot us an email at anxiety warriors podcast at gmail.com. And if you are loving the pod and you haven't already jump over to Apple podcasts, smash that five-star rating and leave us a review. It would mean so much to us. We of course read every word, sometimes yep. multiple times a day. Sometimes um, happy dances come from it too. Yeah. Sometimes we obsessively check it <laughs> just being <Yep>. real. Um, <laughs> And so we'd love to, um, to hear from you in any way. And we thank you. Yes. Yes. Thank you all so much for going on this journey with us. We are so, so grateful you're here. Love you warriors till next time. 